your gospel reading going? And if you got like wide eyes saying, what, what, what? As a church, we are reading through the gospels. Apart from the daily devotional, there's an additional thing. We're reading through the gospels, one chapter a day, Monday to Friday, starting in Matthew, and all the way through to John, which will uh, be on the end, 28th or something of November. There is a bookmark a reading plan at the welcome desk. And also on our website, there's a digital bookmark for all you digital gurus. Graceville.co.za. You can keep track of where we are. But we are in the last week of Jonah. And I know your quiet voice is saying, Aww, end of Jonah. Aww. But in reading the book of Jonah, you read the end. I think I mentioned last week, it stops abruptly. <laughs> hey? Did he run out of paper, ink? I don't know what, what happened there. But it just stops abruptly. You know, it was like, hey, it was like a movie. I think I've told some of you the story. So I once took Esty to a ladies' movie. And you might, buy, might be asking, how do I know it was a ladies' movie? I want to tell you, there was lots of dialogue. <laughs> no explosions, no car chases, and no guns that took nine bullets and shot 110. Come on, we, we know, those are men movies. Eh? They never run out of ammo. Anyway, us doing that babes, I love you sticking thing, which guys, every now and again, take one for the team, take your lady to a ladies movie. Or watch it on the TV, is not it? Girly film. Anyway, we went, I don't know if it's even still around, at the pavilion was this theater, I think it had like 10 seats, but they were lazy boys. Do you, do some of you remember that? You sat in the lazy boy to watch the movie. Just the two of you, and then there was a space, and then another two. You weren't all cramped up. And you could order food and cappuccinos, and they would bring it to you during the movie. It was stunning. It was like, you're, anyway, spoil my babe. Anyway, so we go there. And, um, and so about 10 minutes in, the, the waiter quietly comes. He has a story, a food, a little platter, and our cappuccinos. And um, at this stage of the movie, I knew... I knew without a doubt I'm going to need motivation to stay awake. <laughs> so I whispered to the waiter, but keep bringing food and cappuccinos. Just keep bringing it. Okay, don't worry. Just keep bringing. But this is where the book of Jonah and this movie have a parallel. I know, believe it or not, but there is a parallel. And so at one point in the movie, this couple are on a park bench and they're saying a few words to each other. Then the screen goes dark. Then up comes the end. I was like, what? what? I didn't even, uh, the end, what is going on? So I look across at Est and she's smiling. She loved the movie. So I smile back and I, I hide my what just happened face. I hide that face. I put my heart, it was nice, wasn't it face? I do that. But I think if I had to, we can call the face I should have shown that I read to the end of Jonah face. You can have that same face. Like, What? But here we are, Jonah's at the end. But on the positive side, there's a positive to all of this. Every week, I don't know about you, but every week I've been challenged by something from the book of Jonah. It's been absolutely incredible. In each sermon, I've taken something away. So when I see Jonah one day in heaven, I'm going to go up to him and say, you rock, my bro. I know it was a short book. You ended for I don't know why, but well done. You could have done a bit more on the ending, but well done. It spoke to so many people. We could have done 12. We only did eight because it was short, but spot on. Well done. But there's something very, very important that the very end of Jonah leaves with us. And it's what God says. Jonah records it, but it's what God says to Jonah. So you got a Bible with you? Turn to Jonah chapter 4. Where am I? Here we go. Jonah chapter 4. What's going on here? Jonah chapter 4. There we go. Jonah chapter 4, page 1136 in the Holy Bible. Now, I think you could say this last verse sums up the book of Jonah. It's a great summary. So I'm going to read it. So this is God speaking to Jonah. After Jonah gets grumpy that God was merciful to Nineveh. 
And this is what God says. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Full stop. What God is doing is reiterating to Jonah that despite what people have done, they're important to God. You see, it's in God's character to give people every opportunity to get to know Him and receive mercy from Him. That's God's character. The major difference between the love of the world and the love of God is that God values people most. You know, sometimes, I don't know about you, your, our love for God can get distracted at times. And sometimes our love for God's consumed by the things of the world. Someone once put it like this, in God's city, the inhabitants love people and walk on gold. Um, and that's in, funny enough, it's in Revelation 21, 21. There's gold everywhere. So in God's city, inhabitants love people and walk on gold. While in man's city, the inhabitants love gold and walk on people. Hey? God's greatest God's greatest affections are reserved for people. In God's economy, people come long before projects. And God proves this because of his reprieve for Nineveh, but also his continued pursuing of Jonah. Now, I don't know, if you were God, and Jonah was running away all the time and being all grumpy and all that, surely at some stage you say, actually, enough. No, no, go away. I'm not interested in you anymore. God pursues Jonah all the time. Why? Because God loves people. In the story of Jonah, you, you can't escape the stark contrast where you see Jonah most of the time. I call him non-missional and God-missional. God's on a mission. Jonah doesn't really want to be on a mission. Well, I suppose he is, his own mission. But not God's mission. And so these two mindsets involve different values. The non-missional mindset is self-preservation. Those with it ask, how can we protect ourselves from those who are different from us? That's self-preservation. And the own overwhelming principle is that if everyone was more like us, the world would be a better place. That's a non-missional mindset. Do you know that's how the monastic movement started? You know the monks and the nuns? That's how that movement started. They said the world's horrible. We need to go away and be by ourselves because they aren't like us. And so the clergy were upset with the world and uh, the fact that others were not like them, so they built these monasteries, and then closed themselves inside these walls for most of the time, so they could do their thing while the world did their thing. That was the mona monastic movement. You know, there were two monks, and they joined this monastic order called the Carthusian order. It actually does exist. But in the Carthusian order, you're not allowed to speak. No words. You girls, horrible. But for us guys, hey, we manage. <laughs> So after five years, you're allowed to say something. So after five years, these two guys that joined the Carthusian order get called before the chief monk. And the chief monk says to the first guy, have you got anything to say? He says, yeah. The food is dry, bed's hard, and we wake up too early. The chief monk says, okay. So he turns to the second monk, he says, have you got anything to say? Okay, fine. Five years later, ten years after they joined... Chief monk calls the two monks again. He says to the first guy, have you got anything to say? First monk says, yeah. My shoes are hurting and I don't like working in the vegetable garden. So he turns to the second monk and says, you? Five years after that, 15 years after they've been in the Carthusian order, chief monk calls them again. And so he says to the first guy, he says, listen, have you got anything to say? He says, I have. He says the corridors are cold and we get the same soup day in and day out. He turns to the second monk. He says, have you got anything to say? He says, yes, I'm leaving because all this guy does is complain all the time. <laughs> you see, in those monasteries, the monks and the nuns would go out during the day briefly for some contact and then retreat. But this is very different to what we see in Scripture. In fact... It's the exact opposite in Scripture. Scripture exhorts us and encourages us to make a difference in the world in which we live by being different, not hidden away. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 33, this is Jesus. This is what he says. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. 
Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. We were never meant to hide the love of God. We were meant to give the world brief glimpses of it when we interacted with the world. And so I do want to encourage you, when you interact with the world, reveal God's love. It is transforming. In the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 15, Jesus prays to God the Father. Listen to what Jesus prays. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. The implication is be in the world, but don't be of the world. Make a difference to the people you come into contact with. That's missional. That's being on mission. The Apostle Paul in the Philippian church, Philippians 2, 14, 15 says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing. So that you may come, become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. The church, us here, we are a missional community. A missional community's highest value isn't self-preservation, but actually self-sacrifice. A missional community exists not primarily for itself, but for others. Now, we gather here on a Sunday, absolutely. Invite your friends, invite family, invite your colleagues. But this is not what we do with our lives. This is part of what we do with our life. But Monday to Saturday, we're out in the world, showing the world that there is the love of God in us and through us. Jonah represents this non-missional mindset where God represents our missional mindset. And I love this, ever compassionate, ever gracious and ever pursuing. Jonah runs from his enemies, God runs towards his enemies. Jonah serves himself, God serves the world. And sometimes we can make the mistake Jonah makes. I wish everyone was like us and did what we do. That's a mistake. For us to change, we need to be gripped by the missional heart of God. Love others. Despite what they do, love them. So Jan, uh, uh, Jonah's angry with God over the wilted plant. Do you remember that story? He's cross with God because the plant wilts. But it's Jonah's assumption that God is obligated to make him comfortable and provide for him. He says, after all, he says, I've done what you wanted me to do. Now what do I get in return? That's a non-missional mindset. A missional mindset says, Lord, I will do what you want me to do. Full stop. Not, but then, <laughs> then you need to come my way with some stuff. You know, I do, I understand God's mercy and grace towards Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. I mean, he was an Israelite. He knew God. Yet Nineveh had none of those credentials. Not one. In fact, they were the opposite. But the good news is that God's ability to clean things up is infinitely greater than our ability to mess things up. That's a fridge magnet if ever there was one. Eh? God's ability to clean things up is infinitely greater than our ability to mess things up. I don't know about you, but yo, sometimes, sometimes I can mess some stuff up. But God's ability is greater than that. We've got to trust Him. God's grace is so, is grace is so massive, so wide-ranging. You know, there's no place that you could be right now or where you've been in your past or where you might be going in your future that's ever beyond God's grace. Oh, we've got to know that. Now, I know, you know some people, uh, God's grace will never get through. You keep praying and trusting because God's grace is greater than that. As a missional people, you and I, we proclaim the gospel and we display the gospel. The gospel is displayed in our daily lives as we go about what we do. But the story of Jonah, it's actually a huge encouragement because we see how big God's mission is. He can use infallible people like Jonah, like you and me, to accomplish his mission. You know, you, you get to a place where you say, God, I'm going to do this now. I just want you to give the God stamp. <laughs> you, know, you know that story, eh? God, I'm going to do good stuff. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to do some God stuff but I just need you to bless me while I do it. That's the wrong approach. God, what are you doing? 
can I partner and join with you? I've got to find out what God's doing. You see, the gospel is not the set of truths. If you do all these things, you'll be saved. The gospel is all about who you put your faith in. That last verse in Jonah 4.11, God, God's closing remarks, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? More than 120,000 people. Don't know they're left from their right. Lots of animals. But this verse doesn't, actually doesn't tell us what happened with Jonah. I, I'm, gonna, I'm telling you now, I've got a list of who I'm going to meet in heaven, and I've got questions for them. My question for Jonah is, but what happened next? What happened next? I don't know about you, but if I know there's a movie and I'm not sure of the ending, I'll go watch the end first, because I do not like horrible surprises. I really do. I read the back of the book first and I watch the end of the movie first. Because I've had some movies where you think it's going to end great and it ends horribly and you're like, why even make the movie? It meant to encourage you, surely. There's been some horrible things in the end of some movie. I'll never watch that movie again. I'll even recommend it to anybody. So I do. I watch the end and I I read the end. But I want to ask Jonah, what happened to your life? What happened to you? But you know, Jesus speaks about Jonah. Dave alluded to it too. In fact, you didn't allude to it. You actually spoke about it. It was actually not an illusion. <laughs> How's the move alluded to illusion there? See, I'm a, I'm a speech guy. You know what I mean? But twice in Matthew's gospel and once in Luke's gospel, we see these religious leaders of the time coming to Jesus to ask for a sign of his messianic claims. Oh, Lord, if you just give me a sign. I, I've done that sometimes, Lord. This thing, but just give me a sign. So they say to him, give us a sign that you're the Messiah. Now remember, this is just before Jesus healed that man with a withered hand. They wanted more. Ah, healing, not enough. We need more. We, we need to know. Give us big signs here. And so the Pharisees try and trap Jesus. So they say, he has, he has a man with a withered hand. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now the Sabbath to the Jews is very, it's very special. They had rules for what you can and can't do on the Sabbath. You can walk one mile as long as you don't sweat, like that kind of thing. And, and so Jesus says, well, if your sheep fell in a pit on the Sabbath, can you lift it out? They could. It was one of the rules. The rule is you can lift your animal out the pit. Um, and then Jesus says, but how much more value is a man than a sheep? Okay. Sa- same as God saying to Jonah, should I not have pity on Nineveh? And so it, it reminds us, but you, have, you want me to have pity on the plant. Shall I not have pity on Nineveh rather? It's people. And so there's this missional heart of God. And then secondly, when Jesus comes up to the man with a withered hand, Jesus asks him, stretch out your hand. That's crippled. And you can read it in Matthew 12, 9 to 14. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. The man, the man stretched it out and it was restored, healthy as the other. When you and I place our faith in Christ, the very thing that holds us back, debilitates us, holds us captive, Christ uses to set you free. The man had the withered hand, stretch it out, set free. You see the picture there? Can you imagine the guy going home? Come on, you've got you to know this. The guy goes home, sees his mates. Give me double half five, bro. He's got two, and that's that, double half five. We only normally give you one half five because the other hand's all stuck. He says, give me double half five. What happened, Boot? <laughs> Come with me. You've got to meet this guy. With it hand? Nothing. And so the Pharisees, <coughs> after this incredible miracle with a withered hand, asked Jesus for another sign. I mean, is a withered hand not enough? I want to ask you this morning. Come on. Is some things in your life not enough? God has done incredible things in your life. Is it not enough? You know, I've got to think about this. I think, Lord, actually the fact that you saved me is enough. I'd hate to know what my life would be without Jesus. Trust me. Lord, thank you for saying that's enough. Stop. And then Jesus says to them, he says, no. No sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. They go, what? He says, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights 
in the heart of the earth. Jesus was describing his death and resurrection. And then Jesus goes on. Oh, did you pray over it? Anointed. Well done. Thank you. Oh, that's nice. Babe, maybe you should drink this water and your hair won't go green. Sorry, private joke. Esther's hair's going green from something she's drinking. <laughs> but that color. Woo! Awesome. Now you're all looking at Esty's head to say, is it hair really green? <laughs> Someone said, put ginger and violet in the water. Listen, I want you to have green hair, not pink hair. Anyway, I'm way off track here. But Jesus says, he goes on to say that something greater than Jonah is happening here. And so you've got to ask the question, what? What greater than Jonah? Jesus was a messenger like Jonah, but very different. Jesus willingly submitted himself to God's call, full submission to the Father's call, despite what it would cost him. Romans 5 verse 10, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. And knowing what lay before him, Jesus nevertheless pursued God's mission with all his heart. Hebrews 12 2, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, so that God's enemies, so you and I, God's enemies could become God's people once again. Jonah was about self-preservation. Jesus was about self-sacrifice. No wonder he said he's greater than Jonah. He was comparing himself to Jonah. You know, there's a wonderful story. I actually read uh, the story when they still had slaves in the UK. And um, uh, someone was writing that um, this man went to the slave market in London centuries ago and he went there to buy a slave and so he purchased a slave and as they both walked away from the slave market the man said to the slave give me your hands because they were bound and he removed the bindings from the slave and then he said to the slave you're free to go and the slave responded and he was amazed he said you, you mean I'm, I'm free to walk away to do whatever I want slave, the, slave, the guy that purchased the slave said yeah he said, I, I can say whatever I, I want to say. He said, yeah. He said, no, really, I can go anywhere I want. He said, yeah, anywhere you want. You're free. And this is what the slave said. Can I come and dwell in your house forever? To which the master replied, nothing would please me more. And the reason that story, a secular story, struck me is because that's what Jesus does. You see, the slave realized he wasn't in the hands of a slave owner. He was in the hands of a master. And it's very different. And so does with you and I. Jesus frees us from the penalty of sin. We are free because he's the master, not a slave owner. John 8, 36. <clears throat> so if the son Jesus sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's something to ponder on this morning as we end with our series of Jonah. Jesus sets us free when we respond in faith to his call in our lives. Where he says, surrender to me and you will find freedom. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Come to me all who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I, I read that in the message paraphrase. It's this translation written by a guy. Just, it's a message paraphrase. This is what it says. Come to me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. <coughs> Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I like that. Free and light. And so if that's you this morning, maybe it's time. Lay aside the exhausting life. Time to surrender your life. Living with Jesus front and center, which brings true freedom. You and I were created for that. So let me encourage you this morning. Living for Christ is the greatest adventure there is. But the most satisfying life to experience. Amen. Let's bow our heads together. 
Father, this morning, as we've come to the end of the book of Jonah, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word that's been deposited in our hearts over these weeks. I pray, Father, that your word would find fertile soil and that your spirit would come and water that soil. I thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be a people on mission, your mission. Go out to the world and show them my love. Would you help us with that, Lord? Lord, would you help us to recognize opportunities to show the love of Christ to others? Give us boldness to do that. But Father, I pray that we would be filled with grace and mercy for those that are not like us. But Father, we pray they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We want to be part of that. Lord, I pray, draw them unto you. Your word says, I draw all men unto me. Would you do that, Lord? And we echo the words of the prophet Isaiah. Here I am, use me. We give you thanks for this morning, Lord. To your name, we give all the glory. Amen.